Yeah, so one of the uh, biggest problems with doing a video entitled <laughs> My Favourite Games of 2019 and recording it and editing it in mid-November is that for the rest of November and December you might actually play some pretty top tier games which I did so here they are in no particular order in it okay let me first start out by saying there is something you may or may not know there is nothing more refreshing that I have found in the last few years in playing a game a while after it came out, not just a, a little while, but a long while it came after it came out and everyone stopped talking about it. Because then you get to fully experience it yourself without two sides of the internet screaming at each other while you're doing it. So you really get to appreciate it for what it is. Sunset Overdrive is one of those games for me. It's always sort of piqued my interest, but I've waited until now um, to play it. And what an incredible game. It's not perfect, like some of its jokes fall a bit flat, um, some of its, you know, controls can be a bit dodgy, but what a refreshing game. Like you can clearly, clearly feel the DNA of Spider-Man in there, but the level of irreverence and customization and the way that the jokes are formed knowingly breaking the fourth wall, the fact that you can kind of just play it how you like and the style that you pick or the style that you favor that naturally progresses through the um, leveling up system it's incredible and it's one of those things where if I had played it when it came out I don't know whether my judgment would have been clouded or not but as it is I mean you can clearly feel the DNA of Spider-Man in there but unlike Spider-Man which was beholden to a license I can play as a female pirate firing a shotgun that shoots fire basically shaped like a giant penis while running around from zombies with a giant pink moustache. I love this game. Okay the next game I've already done a video of this and if you want to see that video I'm gonna put a link up in the top right hand corner now Gun Lord X. So I don't want to really re-summarize that video but basically in that video I said I am a huge huge and I can't emphasize how huge but I am a huge Turrican 2 snob. Now Turrican 2 was a platforming game on the Amiga. Um, Turrican 1 got ported everywhere but Turrican 2 didn't. Um, so if you've ever played a Turrican game and it's not on the Amiga, chances are you haven't played Turrican 2. You know, exactly the same. Um, Super Turrican 2, not the same game and Universal Soldier, also not the same game even though it was a port. Turrican 2 is one of the best action platformers of all time. Um, the fact that it was only released on one platform, which you know no one outside of Europe really played, is a crying shame. Super Gun Lord X is changing that. It is a spiritual sequel to Turrican 2. It has giant bosses. It has all of the controls, but mapped to uh, the new control schemes that we have in you know 2019, 2020. Dual analog. It has a fantastic soundtrack. It has huge sprites. It has a sprawling levels. It has the exploration. It is a beautiful, beautiful sequel to a game that came out 30 something years ago. I am truly, truly grateful I got to play Gun Lord X because it's like someone took one of my favorite games and basically made it better. Okay, this uh, next game, Untitled Goose Game, I mean everyone's played it. This is some uh, direct capture that I've got. Um, the uh, the graphics aren't all that, I'll be honest. But, um, I mean it's okay for an indie game. Where's all my stuff gone? So yeah, Untitled Goose Game. Um, in my house, it's gone under the name Asbo Goose. Uh, because that's basically what it is. You're a, you're a goose that runs around um, the sort of counties in, in England. It's not, you know, it's not even suburbia, it's like out in the sticks. And you just play as a goose who gets into trouble. Like your job is to cause as much mayhem to the, to the people of this small town as possible. 
Um, think of that one scene in in Hot Fuzz where uh, uh, Simon Pegg and uh, <laughs> and his buddy are running around trying to chase the goose. It's that. They've made an entire game out of that. The game is charming as all hell, and I don't say that just because you know it's a it's a British game which the you know has gone over a storm in America because of its Britishness. It is just charming on a childlike level as a game based for adults. Even though, yes, my, you know, my child loves it, most children love it. But God, what a fantastic game just to be not a malevolent animal, but just like a kind of petulant animal. It is like playing as a 13 year old, but you're just this goose going around causing as much havoc to these people and relishing in it. That's the pri the, the point is that not only are you being naughty, you enjoy being naughty because that's what you assume geese do. I can understand why this game has done as well as it has and it's a shame that it took until the dying embers of 2019 to come out on the PS4 because since it has come out we have not stopped playing it. Everyone loves it. My children love it, my parents love it, it's a game for everyone because everyone can re relate just to wanting to just mess up someone's day with no consequences. I love this game. Okay, bit of a tonal shift now um, from a malevolent goose to a malevolent mask. Um, Splatterhouse is a game that I have played before but not finished or played for basically more than about five minutes. Um, on the 360. I wanted a copy on the PlayStation 3 because, for, well, for two reasons. One, I actually kind of like Splathouse 3, like the original Mega Drive game. Splathouse 1 and 2, not so much, but 3 I liked. And the game itself appealed to me because it's one of those B-tier games. Now, if you know me, you know that I like ambitious, middle-budgeted, like mildly successful games. I think Splathouse think uh, the Ghostbusters game, um, Call of Juarez, uh, Gunslinger, stuff like that. Like critically, not terrible, not great. Um, aesthetically, not terrible, not great. It's got a lot of, you know, downsides, but overly it's hearts in the right place. Splathouse is kind of one of those. It's a game that distinctly, and this is the reason I've included it in this list, it's a, one of those games that distinctly draws the line between a game that is mature, and a game that is for adults. Those two are very, very, very different. Um, this is a game that is for adults. This is not a game that is mature. This is a game that is designed, or feels like it's designed by an angry 13 year old. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, it is gory and violent, and it's got, you know, it's got collectibles that are just basically just nudity it is a here are the collectibles here um, it is a very adult non mature game and that's completely okay plus if you uh, go through the game and collect most of the collectibles in the first I think it's like five or six chapters you can unlock the original splatter house which was never released in this country um, the arcade version they also have splatter house 2 & 3 which are the Mega Drive ports Splathouse 3, this port has been slightly altered and I'm not down with it, but overly love Splatterhouse. Okay, another game. I am a newfound fan of the Zelda games. I have played Link to the Past, I've played Link Between Worlds, the 3DS one. Um, I have also played Majora's Mask, my favourite one to date. And so I thought I'd give uh, the next critically acclaimed Zelda game a go, which is Oracle of Seasons and Oracle of Ages. Now, I didn't play Ages. Um, I had to pick one or the other, because it was like Pokemon. It was, you know, pick a cartridge, it comes on one of two. Um, so I picked Seasons for no other reason. It was completely arbitrary. And I enjoyed it a lot, actually. I really, really like Seasons. Now, it looks great. For a Game Boy Color game, this looks amazing. Um, it sounds pretty good too in certain spots, but some of the music can be a bit grating. Clearly built on Link's Awakening, oh, which is another game I've also played. Um, clearly based on Link's Awakening, the original uh, Game Boy Color game, game, original Game Boy game. The hook with this one is that rather than leveling up 
Link himself to traverse new areas of the world. What you do is you find these stumps and upgrade a wand. Now the wand, the wand of seasons, or the sorry, the rod of seasons, um, when you wave it, it actually changes the season, allowing you to access new areas by withering trees or freezing lakes. You can now traverse across them and get to new areas that you weren't able to before. It's an interesting tactic, and I'd like to see the way that you can go from uh, Oracle of Seasons into Oracle of Ages. There is a way of transferring like data via a password across. And I really, really would like to take this version of Link into the other game. But overly, yeah, I'm, I mean, it's got that horrible two thirds in, you get a puzzle you can't do because, you know, Nintendo Power. But overly, I really enjoyed it. Okay, this is another one of those games like um, Sunset Overdrive. This game, I could not play it at the time because of all of the noise surrounding it. Some people telling you, no, it's really good, don't worry about it, you like it. Other people going, no, it's literally worse than Hitler. Like, you can't have it either way. It's so black or it's so white. There is no room for mid-tier games. Which is a shame because that's my thing. I love mid-tier games. Um, Far Cry 5, I super enjoyed. And it was such a shame when Far Cry 5 came out because I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, I love this game. Why is everyone shouting about it? Why does everyone hate this game? So, I, I don't care. I really enjoy Far Cry 5. I like the exploration. I like hunting. Story, eh, whatever. It's a Far Cry game. Like, who cares? But even then, some of the aspects of the story are really good. New Dawn, I've waited this long. I played New Dawn. This is actually my son's copy. He wanted it and uh, he's played it before. I, I threw it in. I really enjoyed it. Like, really, really enjoyed it. Um, it's more of a survival game than it is a Far Cry game. But it's still got that heart of darkness. You travel into your own mind and and uh, try and fight your way out your own psyche, essentially. I didn't like the way they tied it into Far Cry 5. I think Far Cry 5 is a much better game. Um, oh, and my character also looks like a female Van Helsing. Badass. Um, yeah, I actually prefer the story of Far Cry 5. I'm one of those people that likes Far Cry 5 story. Um, I also like the way that the mechanics work in Far Cry 5. However, the movement in New Dawn, the new abilities you get, like the double jump and some of the new... Um, uh, uh, without spoilers, I mean, if you can spoil it, you get like superpowers, essentially. And they make the game so fun. This is irreverent. This is just a do what you want. Will it explode? Yes. I oh, will set the dog on them kind of muck around game a bit like my sniper elite 4 um review in my last video i really like new dawn okay so this is another game that came completely as a surprise i knew it existed after my last video which i said that they made a scooby-doo point and click adventure for the game boy color and it was excellent it was really really good i knew that this existed but i had never played it this is scooby-doo mystery and on the cartridge, this is for the Mega Drive, on the cartridge, there are two games, which as you can see, are clearly influenced by LucasArts games. In particular, um, what is it, Day of the Tentacle. So it's very clearly influenced by Day of the Tentacle. The verb table is there, the inventory is there, the combine X with Y, like the, you know, the pulley and the rubber chicken thing, like that's all there. Um, the Mega Drive isn't known for its sprite scaling, and this has got excellent sprite scaling to, so you can move the characters from forward to background. You'll also notice that I'm directly controlling the characters, which is something that you can do, which I thought was quite novel. Um, where you move the characters where you need to be, then pull up the cursor, then select the verb, then select the item in the world. Very, very, very clever. As far as the graphics go, it uses the full range of the Mega Drive's color palette in a really nice cartoon sh like shaded way. The um, two chapters themselves play out like episodes. So you've got one that's set in a hotel, which is the one we're looking at here. And the next one here is set in a uh, theme park. Now the one set in the hotel is better because it's a much more fleshed out point and click adventure. However, the one set in the theme park is obviously got the better visuals so two stories none of them will take you too long there are you know maybe a couple of hours each if you get stuck 
generally speaking, not very long, but very, very, very good. If you get a chance, play this. It's called Scooby-Doo Mystery for the Mega Drive, and it is excellent. Really good point-and-click adventure. Okay, here's another one. I have played Earthworm Jim before. I played it on the PC CD-ROM. That's the version I had. Um, never got very far in it. I think I only ever played New Junk City. So, with the Mega Pive, uh, link up the top there, my um, my Mega Drive Raspberry Pi that I built with, it's got all of the Mega Drive games, Master System games, oh, uh, what else have got? 32X, Mega CD, you know, stuff like that. I decided to um, play through Earthworm Jim because I thought, yeah, why not? You know, it's it's Christmas, so I've got nothing better to do. Why not just play through Earthworm Jim? Um, bit of a mistake. Earthworm Jim, for all of the reverence that goes with it, isn't very good. Like, I didn't know this going in, but Earthworm Jim ain't very good. Like, it starts off really good, and the graphics and the sound, excellent. Love the animation, love the sound. But my god, the gameplay and the difficulty spike is insane! Like, when you get to the last couple of levels, there is some stuff it requires you to do that is just not fun. It stops being fun a lot longer. Uh, a lot quicker, sorry, than it should. I mean, I am fairly patient, but even I struggled to get through this game. Like, great animations, great music, really, you know, iconic uh, character design, but my god, this game is not good. Not good at all. Okay, and speaking of things that are not good at all, here's a game made by Blizzard, of all people. Um, Blizzard, known for uh, the Lost Vikings, very good. Rock and Roll Racing, also very good. Uh, Blackthorn is not very good at all. In fact, Blackthorn is terrible. Um, for a game that is trying desperately, judging by the life bar, judging by the way it sort of controls its viewpoint, it's clearly aiming for Prince of Persia. Um, maybe influenced by Flashback, like, which is the reason I started playing it. Um, it's what's known as a cinematic platformer. So lots of frames of animation, uh, plays on an invisible grid, so depending on where you stand, you can either run, jump, you know, the, the controls are standard. And remembering that Flashback used a single button on the Amiga. Um, you could set up separate buttons, but you know, for all of your controls, you used one button. When you started shooting and whatnot, you know, you needed a few more. Uh, Blackthorn is awful. Blackthorn is on the 32X. So this is a 32-bit, allegedly, uh, machine. The running is awful. The shooting is awful. The jumping, oh my god, the delay. The um, the actual combat itself, you're supposed to hide in the shadows by just pressing up, but you don't know when they're going to shoot and when they're not going to shoot. It's just oh, an abysmal game. It was a slog to get through this. But um, yeah, that's the last one on this list. Don't play Blackthorn. Give up. Anyway, happy 2020.